Hi, we're here today with Jamie Wicca uh, at uh, his home brewery. Um, do you have a name for the home brewery? Yes, it's called the Burbank Brewery. The Burbank Brewery, okay. Uh, I've been brewing 25 years. Uh, this is a 10 gallon system, uh, gravity flow, uh, natural gas. Uh, what are we going to brew today? We're going to brew a British Mild. Mmm, sounds good. Uh, this is a Jamil recipe, so I hope it works out. He's a very well known brewer. Uh, he's won a lot of medals. So. I, I've been itching to try this recipe, so I'm going to give it a shot. All right, well, let's get to it. All right. It's just a whole house charcoal water filter. It just takes the chlorine out mostly. And Where do you get one of those? Uh, any home center, Home Depot, Home Lowe's, whatever. What are you putting in there, Jamie? I'm putting in some charcoal filtered water. Chicago, fresh. Not that stale kind. And you want to make sure everything is hooked up before you start filling stuff up, because then it's a little harder to move. 13 gallons of water. Make sure your valves are closed, right? Yeah, you want to do that. That's a little uh, thing I uh, found out is uh, just a little pipe I made to fill up the uh, mash tun. The whole system's gravity fed, so when I start filling, this is the hot liquor tank, this is the mash tun, and over there is a the boil kettle. So in this case, today I'm making a mild, and uh, you really don't need a lot of sparge water for it. Uh, but you don't want to over sparge either. So what I'm going to do is start filling the hot liquor tank with water. That's going to run down in the mash tun. That's going to run it down into the boil kettle. And that way I won't over sparge because I already have my water, my top up water, in the boil kettle. All right. What are you going to do? Now I'm going to light the baby. These are homemade burners I made at work. I estimate they're about 40 to 50,000 BTU. That's all you need. You could even use less over here. It's a homemade mixer I made. I got parts from American Science and Surplus. Couple of bullies at Ace Hardware. I guess it uh, started getting kind of hot in the bottom there. I guess it did. There you can see the mixing paddle. Let's just spin that real quick so we can see it. So there you go. When we get grain in there, we're probably not going to be able to see that paddle too well. And you can see the false bottom. a aluminum rod that I notched out at different intervals and I measured one gallon and I marked it off. This helps you keep track of how much liquor you got in the, uh, in the brew kettle or mash tun or whatever you're doing. 
One, two, three, four. I need four gallons in here. I'm just gonna put that in there and wait. Okay. Measure from the center bottom. As you can see here, the, the water is already warm by the time it's gone into the brew kettle. And we're about three gallons right now, so pretty soon we're going to be able to shut it off and then concentrate on the mash tun. You want to get it going down the side. Start measuring how much water is in here. I think I need about three gallons. Really sounds like a lot's happening with that uh, <laughs> those catch cups bubbling away. There's a little cup in the middle between the flames here. I don't know if you can really see it. Yeah, and that's catching the water. So it don't put out the flame. It's the water vaporizing out of the uh, center catch cup. You know, it's, a, it's just a temperature difference, and the, the, kettle, the bottom of the kettle is the lowest point, so it all drips down the center. Condensating. All right, so now that's full. So now, all we got left is a hot liquor tank to fill. I should tell you before I started, I, I washed everything out with PBW Brewery Wash. Uh, it's a really nice product. It's, it cleans all the malt and everything out, and you, you get a nice, nice fresh kettle to start with. So to summarize, we've got the hot liquor tank here. This is just a converted beer keg. He uh, fills it with the filtered water. That then we heat it up. And he's got a shutoff valve here. That pours down into his mash tun, uh, which he has a mix mix, a homemade mixer. And He's also heating the mash water in there so you can hear the strike temperature. And when, that, uh, when the mash is done, he has a recirculation pump here. A recirculation pump. And again, valve controlled. So he can uh, start the recirculation of the wort. And it will filter out the grains of husk. So he's got that uh, false bottom in the bottom. And eventually the runoff, which is called, will be uh, clear. And that will then wind up into the boil kettle, at which point he'll add hops after he comes to a boil. Boil for a specified amount of time according to the recipe. And uh, we'll be ready for fermentation. Here I'm making calls for three and a half gallons. If I put three gallons in, there's a half gallon under the false bottom, so we're good there. This is the uh, sparge arm I made. Just got a 3 8 copper tubing. I'm going to hook that up right now. That doesn't get in the way of uh, adding the grain? Actually, I just want to see how it fits. Okay. Got a good fit, so I'm going to, I'm good there. I'm going to wait on that. All we got to do is wait for our temperature to come up to where we want it. Usually, if you heat the water up about 12 to 15 degrees higher, so when you put your grain in, it'll cool down to the temperature that you want to mash at. These are just little wooden covers I made with some aluminum foil on top. It should be replaced. 
and that's just to keep the heat in the mash, son, right? Yeah. And then it's just insulation I wrapped around it to try and keep the heat in. Now we're going to put the pH 5.2 buffer in. It's, what it is, it's phosphates. And uh, you want a tablespoon for five gallons of finished beer. So I'm going to throw in two tablespoons, mix it up, and we're good to go. It's a no-brainer. No adjustments necessary? No, it automatically adjusts between 5.2 to 5.5. You're not even going to test it. You're nope. going to trust it implicitly. It's a real nice product. You don't have to mess around with meters or measuring or anything. You'll get your right right there without a problem. Where do you get this stuff from? Well, any good homebrew supply shop should have it. Most of them do. We're in the man cave now and we're looking at the brewing program I have. This is uh, Beer Tools Pro and we're making a mild. We're using uh, 11 pounds of Mara Cider. That's a British malt. We're using uh, two pound, uh, one one point three pound of caramel sixty. That's a Brees. That's American malt. We're using a dark crystal, which is Thomas Fawcett. It's a hundred one pound, one hundred and twenty lava bond. It's a real nice, flavorful uh, British crystal. And we're using uh, pale chocolate, which is uh, another British product. It's uh, two hundred lava bonds, a lot lighter than other chocolate malt, and uh, has a real nice flavor. Uh, and we're using uh, East Kent Goldings for hops at 60 minutes, one hop addition. And we're using uh, White Labs Essex Ale Yeast, which is uh, seasonal yeast, comes out once a year. And we're using yeast slurry from a previous batch. And uh, you can go on MrMalty.com and uh, it'll tell you how much yeast to use in whatever way you're using, whether you're making a starter, dry yeast, yeast slurry what have you, and it'll tell you the correct amount of yeast to use for your batch. It's real nice, free. Now we're going to measure some, uh, some of the Brees American Crystal 60. My, uh, Polder Digital Scale. Digital Scales come down in price now. You can get them just about anywhere. Under $50. If you don't have exactly the amount that you need, don't worry about it. Sometimes mistakes are what makes a new beer. You're this home brewing after all. Yeah, like I say, sometimes if you make a mistake or you you don't have a, something you need, and might be pleasantly surprised at the outcome. Okay, so that's our crystal mall. What we got here is a pound of the Thomas Fawcett Pale Chocolate Malt. Actually, the color is uh, 180 to 250. 200 about average, a little over 200. And here's a pound of the Thomas Frost Dark Crystal, color 118 to 124. And what else do we need? Oh, we needed the Marisotter Fail Malt. This is a good, good British pale malt that most of your British beers are made with. We've got another Thomas Fawcett product. Here's my big scale.
I'll be down 11 pounds on the head. I think I've done this once or twice. Yeah, it comes with a little practice, huh? Yeah, 11 pounds isn't any. Okay, so we got our grain. This grain. And we got our crystal ball. That's about 14 and a half pounds. Here we have some hops, either one pound bags, either from Hops Direct. They have a pretty good price, usually from uh, $8 to about $15 a pound. They come in uh, vacuum packed aluminum packs. We got about 9 pounds, that should do me for this year. Seven. Seven ounces of gold. U.S. gold. This is the yeast I'm going to be using today. This is Essex Ale yeast. It's a top cropping strain. I'm not going to use all this. This is uh, 500 milliliters. I'm going to use about 300 milliliters, so about half of this amount. This is really compacted. This has been sitting for a week in the fridge. So it's really thick. Now it's from a previous batch? Yeah, it's from one previous batch. Uh, the original one I made a starter, and this is the yeast I got out of the batch, so. It's a week old, so you can go up to two weeks, but no problem. Now we're gonna grind some wall. Again, this is a homemade device I made. There are very small grinders you can buy that do the job just as well. Come on, Betsy. There we go. What are those wheels made out of? It's a uh, great plastic. I mean, it doesn't really have to be. It's a very hard plastic. Sometimes taste uh, your different malts. So you kind of give an idea of what flavor they contribute to the beer. This one has a coffee taste. That's probably what the flavor is going to contribute. I need my uh, speaker. What you're looking to do is just crack it open. You don't want to grind it into a flour. Whoop. I think we had a little rock in there there or something that was... Uh, a little something something in there. Jammed up the rollers. I'm gonna have to talk to that guy about the warrant feet. Happen on brewing. 
day, I mean, most of them go smoothly. Sometimes you run into a little problem here and there. That's where innovation comes in. That's where Americans outshine the rest of the world. Innovation. Television on there? No. You get that model, huh? That was extra. You just want to crack it open. I mean, you don't want to get it too powdery. Now we're going to check our temperature in the mash tun, see if we can mash it in. A uh, fire metal thermometer, I find I have good luck with it. You can pick these up most anywhere. We're about 145. We got to go up to about 160. 162. And how do you determine that? Uh... Well, uh, my experience and a general rule of thumb is you want to go 12 degrees to 15 degrees higher than your, you want to mash temp at. That's a, if all your measuring is correct, you measure the grains correctly, you measure the water correctly, but if your measurement's off, the temperature is going to be different when you mash in. So you want to make sure you measure everything as, as exact as you can. Now I'm going to add the uh, digital alarm thermometer to the hot liquor tank, so when we get our temperature, we we'll shut off the flame, and that's going to be 170 degrees. Okay, right now we got I can't read it. It's 95 degrees. 97. I got it set for 170. When we get to 17, we'll shut off the flame. Yeah, I picked it up for under $20 at Kmart. It comes in real handy. You can use it for cooking too. Yeah, I decided to throw in. It's 165 degrees. You just want to scoop it in slowly. You don't. If you go too fast, you'll get balls and you'll lose uh, efficiency and you don't want that because you're working so hard to make a great beer and you want everything just perfect so you just sprinkle it in so you avoid those falling up this is where that mash mixer really comes in handy because you're yeah, I found it to be quite the deal. I got actually I got the plans from Brewing Techniques. Uh, I don't know if that magazine's still around, but it's still on the internet. But if you you could use a paddle in one hand if you don't. I mean, it's a little more work. It'll do just as good. All you want to do is get the grain in there without it falling up. Hopefully if I measured everything right, which sometimes I don't, I'll hit the temperature I want. Trying to stay below 155, 150 to 155. This is an ale, and I want to get a little bit of body, a little bit of sweetness with that higher temperature range. It'll give also a more mouth feel because you don't really want a lot of carbonation in this beer. 
you put too high carbonation, it'll it'll affect the flavor so much that you won't get the the proper enjoyment out of the beer. And because we have dark malts in there, it'll it'll affect it if there's too much carbonation. Whereas you have a if you have a like a Belgian triple that's hardly carbonated with with light malt, it'll be just fine, but on your darker beers, you don't want a lot of carbonation. Especially for being such a, a light, uh, low alcohol beer, actually, it's about 4%, but you want to taste the flavor of the malt. And you don't want to taste the carbonation. You see the inside there? Now I'm smelling some coffee notes already. Here it grains in. Let's stir some more, get it all wet. Gotta get it spilling. Okay, now we're going to see if we did this right. We hit the temperature. Climb and it's almost 150. Hope it don't go too much more. Oh, 152. All right, we'll cover this up. I think that's just where I wanted it too. I'm a lucky man today. Let it rest for an hour. Uh, after 15 minutes you get about 90% of the conversion. Um, most people, home brewers anyway, let it go for an hour or more to get uh, develop, well get full conversion in maybe develop a little more, get a little bit more flavor out of the uh, grains. And there's our temperature. See the alarm goes off. If you're nearby you can hear it. I'm going to turn it down to the minimum just to maintain the heat. And turn the alert off. It kind of gets annoying. Well, it's been an hour and five minutes. I think the conversion has fully happened, and uh, now we're going to recirculate. Temperature's gone down to about 145. I'm going to put my sparge arm on. Ow! Don't grab a hold of hot metal. You will not like it. Connecting the sparge arm. If I could find a wrench. Now we 
we'll turn our pump on. Set the flow rate. I'm gonna extend this down. Flashing too much. And we're going to turn on the heat. See, we want to raise up the temperature of the mash. To about 170. going to happen on brew day. What was that noise? Oh, something in the pump. It worked itself out. Yeah, you want to raise your temperature up in your mash to mash out. That will stop the conversion uh, the enzymes. It will denutrialize them. Well, denature them. And that will stop the conversion. Uh, overly converted taste will, will probably dry out the beer a little bit and create some harsh flavors which you don't want. So we're going to bring the temperature up to 170, and in the process, recirculating will clear the work. And by the time we, when that, about 15, 20 minutes, we'll start running off into a brew kettle and be a very clear work. Uh, with very little grain particles in there. If you have too many grain particles, it'll, it'll create an astringency. And uh, that's not good either. So you want to try and avoid that. I'm going to put the thermometer back in. And we wait for it to get up to 170. Which will take 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, it goes about a minute, minute and a half uh, per degree. So we got about 20 minutes. It's about 164 right now, so we got just a little bit more to go. When you get the temperature up 170, you'll you'll be able to get more out of the malt, and that will increase your efficiency, which saves money. Once you calculate your efficiency properly, you'll uh, know exactly what kind of beer you're making and how much hop to put it in and how it's going to taste. Alright, we're going to start uh, drawing off now. This is about the rate I use, flow rate. Uh, it'll probably take about an hour and a half since it's a uh, less malt than this beer. Other beers are higher gravity it will take about two hours. I find I get better uh, efficiency that way than going off as fast as I can. I mean you certainly could but you lose a lot of efficiency. Now I'm just going to draw down the center and if you look Deep inside there, you'll see the color change. 
Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start the uh, sparge arm. This is called a hot liquor. This is just hot water. It's gonna flow over the top and it's gonna rinse out all the malt sugars and flavors out of the grain into the boil kettle. You want to keep your level um, no more than an inch above the grain bed. And the reason being, if you if you if it's too high, uh, one reason is your grain will start floating, and uh, it could draw some astringency out of the grains. Right now we're at about 175 about five degrees higher than I wanted but it'll be okay and it's okay because we've got the pH adjusted properly exactly I'm gonna close that up now that we're drawing off into the kettle I'm gonna put some flame on it And that way, when the kettle's up to full volume, it won't take long before it'll start boiling. Whereas if we just let it drain into here and then start to flame, it'll take a lot longer. You don't want to make it any longer than you have to through a day. In the boil kettle, I'm going up to 13 gallons. Because uh, after an hour and a half boil, That'll leave 11 and a half gallons. Uh, half a gallon will be in oil kettle for truck. So it'll leave 11 gallons. I take a half gallon off for a starter batch. And then that'll leave 10 and a half gallons for a batch. Right now we're about 12 gallons. Got another gallon to go. Looks like we had a little bit of a boil over. Probably should have been watching this a little closer, huh? Okay, this is 2.7 ounces of US Golding we're gonna add in at the 60 minute mark. This will give it bitterness and a little bit will carry over into the flavor. We wanna add them slowly at the beginning because it will boil up. There we go. Off the races. Now, we drained our uh, mash ton. This is the liquor that was in the mash ton. So it's all drained out now. Just flip that over in a gravity fund. Now we gotta get rid of this. Now we're gonna clean out our mash tart. Looks like a garbage bag. Cleaning out the spent grains. Get them on 
monsoon outside, huh? Look at this rainy day. Nothing else better to do but brew. Well, I can think of a few things, but not many. What I'm doing now is sanitizing the uh, wort chiller. So I'll make sure you, everything after the boil is always sanitized. Otherwise you could have an infection. And you don't want that after all that hard work. So what I use is just plain water and iota for. You can get this at most homebrew shops, probably all of them. Uh, quarter ounce for two and a half gallons, half ounce. One teaspoon, one and a half gallons of water. That's for... Uh, never use hot water. You want 12 and a half parts per million iodine. So, uh, a half pound for five gallons. What we're going to do now, we're going to go ahead and shut it off. Then we're going to start whirlpool. Take your stir. Stir it up. Try not to aerate it. Just Get a whirlpool going. Now just put a lid on it. And that'll help everything go to the bottom once the whirlpool stops. So all your trough troop will be in the center and then you can draw off the side and then you won't get any troop in your fermentation. As it turns out, our hot liquor tank is going to be used for our fermenter. You don't need to sanitize it because it's already been uh, filled with hot water for so long that that killed anything in there. There's a little extra water in there, so we've got to empty it out. A little bit of water in there I want to get out. Okay, close back up. Custom made top. Where's that? Uh, this is the filler. Put my thermometer the top so I can take the temperature of the word as it goes in the kettle. here. My thermometer back up. Now we've got to hook our chiller hoses up. Check 
chiller, cold water comes in from the bottom. And the hot water comes from the, from the top, so it's a counter flow. I usually go just go outside, dump it in the grass, the water, but you could fill up your wash machine with it if you want, or if you have a spare tub or tank, you could reuse it. Now I usually take this when it starts coming off first and I I use it for starters for the next batch but today I'm not going to do this because I don't need it. So I'm going to let it flow a little bit. And I'm going to go get my hydrometer and see how well I did. There's our wort. See what the gravity is. Looks like about 1040, 1038, just is what we wanted. Okay, now we're gonna let the work flow. Look at our temp gauge. A little too chilly, we gotta open up. Man, look at that, it's chilly. We're gonna open up our valve. Try and get that up to temp. One advantage of brewing in the winter, your chill water is really cold. But it could also be a disadvantage. We got 64. I'm gonna back down the water a little. back and forth with the cold water and the adjusting here and the output of the outflow. Probably be about the color of the beer when it's done. And it looks like we hit our gravity right on. So we're at the top end of the range on the gravity, on the hops, and the color is about midway.
is how much we've drained so far. About a quarter of the way. And after this is done, we'll pitch the yeast. I think the yeast is ready to pitch. What do you think, Rich? It's uh, looking kind of anxious, I think. It's jumping out of that bottle. It's eager, for sure. Cool. Thank you, Jamie, for sharing your brewing day with us. Well, you're very welcome anytime. I hope this helps somebody. Uh, I really enjoy doing it. I've been doing it for 25 years. And uh, probably will keep doing it for a long time. Thank <laughs> you.